So, you want to know how to build a cathedral, but you don't exactly know where to begin. Well, fret not simple child, because I may know a thing or two about building them. However, unlike simple build tutorials and time lapses, we're going to unravel what makes these gothic wonders so unique, how they are divine yet terrifying, because today, we're going to learn how to build a cathedral. It's often daunting starting a project of such scale, but the best way to begin is right at your feet, because the first thing that comes to designing a cathedral is its floor plan. In tradition, Gothic churches followed a layout structured around the crucifix form, operating the schematic in a various assortment of ways. The most common was the Latin cross, a simple nave, asp, narthex, and flanking transepts was all that was required. However, this plan is malleable to whatever additions may come over the years, such as smaller chapels and even residency. The general layout of a cathedral would also depict the massing structure of the columns and walls to be constructed. In order to create the sensation of divinity through verticality and ornamentation, these spaces were architectural feats of engineering during the medieval period. Columns distribute the weight of a cathedral, allowing the mass of the walls and roof to traverse down in compression. Cathedrals also get rather dark, and it's through the addition of windows, they allow their patrons to read the words of God both in scripture and upon the glaze they are made from. However, glass isn't the strongest thing in the world, and stone being as heavy as well, stone needs to be supported by, you guessed it, more stone. But how do you do that? With conjunction to columns, medieval architects and stonemasons used something called a buttress. In the early days of church architecture, these buttresses were huge hulks of stone that braced walls allowing cathedrals to stand, but it came at the cost of having small, narrow windows that made the spaces inside rather gloomy. The solution? Simply space the thickness of a buttress with interconnecting stone arches and distribute the weight and allow light to enter the side of the cathedral. These stone arcs from wall to buttress appeared to leap over the air as if they were flying, hence they were dubbed as a flying buttress. But the success of gothic ingenuity doesn't come just from columns and buttresses. Lying in plain sight is a design implementation that would allow cathedrals to grow bigger and scrape the heavens they sought to make on earth. This is a pointed arch. To the unascending eye, it looks like a regular arch, but its ingenuity comes with a bit of interesting history. Prior to the Gothic period, it was a style known as Romanesque. Its telltale sign is its extensive use of round Roman arches. This design originates from well, Rome, but mainly from the Roman Basilica. Prior to its Christian association, the Roman Basilica was used as a large forum space in ancient Rome, using the Roman arch to create these large grand spaces. But as churches began to be built during the medieval age, stonemasons and architects wanted to build taller without using so much material. The solution came from the Gothic arch, which in simple geometry is just two circles intersected, but it gives us a shape that allows cathedrals to build taller, narrower, and use less material. It's this shape that gives Gothic architecture its defining quality, its stylistic appearance, not only used in structural detail, but hidden in plain sight. Windows in cathedrals come in a whole assortment of shapes and sizes, with the styles of their time influencing their design. You'll notice they are often stained pieces of glass that have been glazed to depict events in scripture from the Bible. This was done to help illuminate these sacred scriptures as they were being read during Mass. Gothic windows in particular use stone mullions to help support their lead frame panels with an assortment of glyphs to ordain their designs. This ornamental dressing is known as tracery. Filled with daggers and trefoils, this ornamentation changes from simplistic geometry to greatly more dramatic and exuberant detail over the centuries. The rayonant and flamboyant periods hold some of the most exuberant tracery. This period, often remarked for its particular focus on light, being regarded as divine upon entering a cathedral. Windows may be built in different patterns, such as panel design, reticulated, intersecting, or form an assortment 
assortment of geometric design. In section you'll see there is an order when assembling windows of this nature. This arcade of them closest to the ground are known as the aisle windows that line the main body of the church. In larger cathedrals though, we get two more levels of these windows, the triforium and above that, the clerestory. Triforiums are often designed with an arcade positioned above the aisles, atop the columns, and are usually very narrow in most cases and only ever used by choir or attendees in large gatherings. Above this is the largest and often most decorated windows known as the clerestory. It's these windows that get the most illuminated panels of stained glass and pool the largest amount of light. For larger windows that dress the transept and narthex facades, you'll notice they use a rosette or panel design with variation with every cathedral. So design as you so wish. While you may have your walls and windows in order, you'll most likely be wanting a ceiling. Cathedrals are most often lined with this unusual shape seen here. This is known as a vaulted ceiling. While complex to understand at first, the vaulted ceiling is a geometrical result of two cylinders intersecting, creating an X-shaped pattern. This gives us a self-braced ceiling that can support its own weight whilst also bracing the weight of the walls either side and also give great acoustics. Like windows, vaulted ceilings come in an assortment of styles. There are rib vaults, leon vaults, fan vaults, pendant fan vaults, hanging pendant fan vaults, groin vaults, star vaults, and well, you get the idea. However, vaults may appear to be the roof of a cathedral, but this is not the case, as they must be shielded from dust and snow with an external roof, often a high-pitched truss roof. But a cathedral's nave built with its main body only gives so much height to a church. Medieval towns and cities were at constant rival with one another for one thing, who could touch the heavens higher? Well, if you want to do that, you're going to need a tower. Most cathedrals have two bell towers, and if you're lucky, a third one utilized as a crossing tower. More interesting depictions like Eli Cathedral utilize an octagonal base tower, and even dome structures like St. Paul's in London. Gosberg itself takes its influence from Lincoln Cathedral, which has three square turret design towers, but you may challenge yourself and attempt to build a spire. These pointed and slender needle-like roofs gave cathedrals great verticality in height and also prevented the accumulation of snow. Inside these gargantuan behemoths adorned with gargoyles are bells. Cathedrals utilize bell towers to announce the times of mass and ring after their celebrations. Often cases bells are rung from a separate chamber through drawstrings with a spider web of timber supports to properly suspend them up. Stairs are often hidden in the turrets to spiral up into these spaces, granting access to the roof, crossing tower, and balconies of most of the cathedral, a secluded space high above the heavens. But I feel no matter how much I describe these beautiful wonders, there will still always be some smooth brain individuals out there in the world that will comment stuff like, we can't build these structures, ever heard of gravity? Go touch some grass bro, go outside, get alive. And to those people I say, yeah, let's go outside. Now we're outside and oh, what's that? Oh shit, I forgot to run. Is that a cathedral? Oh my god, how is it standing back up? That's crazy, that's crazy. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral and you'll notice right away, it's quite small. This isn't considered a gothic cathedral because it happens to be in, well, Australia, which is where I'm from. Because I've never seen a gothic cathedral. I've never been to Europe, so this is the best I got. And this is the best you got as well. But its size doesn't detract any way whatsoever to its beauty and its charm. Its exterior is rather blankly dressed, but it doesn't mean it isn't adorned with gargoyles and trefoils and tracery all over. While its exterior is rather charming and spectacular, its interior is even more lavishly decorated. But upon requesting to film inside a couple of weeks ago, we were met by an email from Julie, who said to film inside the cathedral would be deemed as inappropriate. Naturally, we obliged her request. Until we saw someone else do it. Inside, you'll notice that St. Patrick's is, well, quite dark, and that's because it doesn't actually have a triforium, nor are the clerestory windows awfully that big, but it makes up more in its significant use 
of tracery. Each of the aisle windows is slightly different to the next, and that's deliberately done. Wardell had a high emphasis on the individuality crafted by the stonemasons that made his cathedral. While these windows aren't too awfully stained for that matter, there are some parts of the cathedral that do have stained glass panels. Due to this being a neo-Gothic cathedral, and also the fact it's in Australia, it doesn't conform to all of the traditional quirks seen in European cathedrals. While the aisles of the cathedral have a vaulted ceiling, the nave itself doesn't, instead of opting for a timber-framed roof instead. The cathedral does conform to the typical Gothic floor plan. There's still a nave, there's transepts either side, an ambulatory, and even chapels that adorn it. And even externally, it utilizes buttresses to distribute the weight of the walls and allow light to enter the cathedral as well. So, all in all, it's a pretty good cathedral. But you may have noticed that cathedrals are extremely well proportioned. These ratios, rules, and guidelines all determine how these things are put together. And they span over centuries, nearly a millennia of work. To understand these ratios, these principles, it'd be so baffling to put into one singular video to understand. But that may be a bit daunting, so you might want to follow a layout. Because these architects and stonemasons weren't inspired by nothing, they were inspired by the structures that had already been built. Because cathedrals are not only reflections of the past. However, some of you may have wanted a one-to-one -one tutorial on how to build a cathedral, and while I could slave away at my computer and make a 15-part tutorial on how to build Gospel Cathedral, there's just one slight problem. It wouldn't be yours. The beauty of Gothic architecture is not solely its engineering, its terrifying demeanor, nor its stylistic choice. Its beauty comes from craftsmanship of inspiration. Gothic architecture is littered with personal embellishment from the hands that made it. It's comedic, it's scary, and it's embedded with personality, with every mark chipped and etched away by someone. It's a living narrative. If there's anything I wish for you, it's to build however you may please, with the knowledge of how to put it all together properly. So, now you know how to build a cathedral. Go ahead and build your very own. If you enjoy this content, even if it's rather unusual in nature, then please join our Patreon. You can get build downloads, I know, to inspire your very own structures, and even have builds honored in your name, and become a living piece of Gosberg's history. For now, I'll hammer myself away and work on the next video. Till then, happy building, and take care.